Welcome to Widener University Commonwealth Law School. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome all of you. My name is Christian Johnson. I'm the dean here at the law school. And most importantly, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Don McGann, who will be speaking with us tonight. His most important credential, of course, is he is the class of 94 from our law school. And, uh, <laughs> As all of you, of course, know, uh, Don was White House counsel to President, Dr President Trump, one of the most powerful men, of course, in, in the world. Uh, we're thrilled to have him here. Don counts as many of his accomplishments, of course, his management of the judicial selection process, re resulting in the appointment of historic number of judges over the, the past few years. Also helped with uh, President Trump's deregulatory initiatives that he's instituted. I really like this quote. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell stated that Don concluded his tenure not only as the best White House counsel I've seen on the job, but more broadly as one of the most successful and, and consequential aides of any president in recent memory. Please uh, join me in welcoming Don McCann. Uh, We'll be passing cards around for you to write down questions uh, for, uh, for Don, and, uh, and then we'll be collecting those, and then we'll have a question and answer session at, after he finishes his remarks. Thank you, it's great to be here. I appreciate the kind introduction. I think it's gonna be all downhill from here because there's <laughs> CLE involved, so I'm gonna have to keep it a little dry. Uh, it's great to be back. I've not been back in a long, long time. I see many familiar faces. Some faces I don't know. It's good to stand in front of a classroom. I feel like calling on people, look at the seating chart. I want to call on the person in the back there, maybe to recite the facts of Goldilocks and the Three Bears from both perspectives. How are you? <laughs> if you're a student here, listen to him. He knows how to write. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, something that's fascinating to me as a lawyer from Washington, D.C., but not necessarily fascinating to everyone, but yet something that impacts uh, many, many lives, which is the state of the regulatory apparatus that is the administrative state in Washington, D.C. I want to talk a little bit about trends that have happened over the past couple of years, what the president has done, uh, what may be going to court, what not may be going to court, and at least get your money's worth for CLE. And then I think uh, I'm under, my understanding is you're going to ask some questions, and that's where it's probably going to get a little more interesting, uh, certainly more interesting for you, not for me. Um, th the president uh, came in uh, to office with a skepticism of administrative power. Uh, he, being a real estate person, had tussled with City Hall his whole career, so he had an instinctive distrust of the concentrated power that, that happens in administrative agencies. Uh, in my own view, mirrored that, but it was a little bit more sophisticated, perhaps, um, than, than, uh, than I, I uh, would, would give myself credit for. But uh, administrative state is one where you have the three branches essentially collapsed into one place. Uh, agencies promulgate rules, so it's a form of legislating. They tend to enforce the rules, so it's a version of executive power. And oftentimes, they adjudicate the cases themselves. And then when these things go to court, Courts have developed doctrines over the years that give them a tremendous amount of deference uh, and uh, a great deal of power. And often when you're in the, when the regulatory thicket, particularly in the enforcement side, uh, you don't have much of a way out. Uh, and this is something that over the past couple of years I think has started to change, and I want to sort of lay out a little bit of, a little bit of that in detail. First thing the president did was issue an executive order, uh, which is commonly called two for one. Uh, it requires agencies, whenever they promulgate a new rule, they have to remove two regs from the books. Some said this was a gimmick, it was symbolic, it really wasn't gonna matter, but it turns out in the first year of the administration, the ratio was 11 to one, second year was four to one. Then I left, so I, kept, I stopped keeping track. Uh, but it did have an effect in that it, it stemmed the tide of what seemed to be new regulations for the sake of regulations. Uh, the Code of Federal Regulations is many volumes, it takes up many volumes in li li law libraries. Um, some people read them, uh, sometimes people even the work at agencies read them, but oftentimes uh, they, they look at that as almost interpretive guidance, and then they, they sort of do things more of a case-by-case, case, and judgment plays a large role, which is the second issue, personnel is policy. 
I had the honor of, of having a, a role in interviewing a number of people to run administrative agencies uh, going in. The typical arc of an administrative agency head is someone tends to be a lawyer um, in, the, in the subject matter. They tend to um, uh, have their eye on, on a fancy title. Sometimes you get a car and driver with these jobs. Oftentimes they get these jobs, the first thing they do is find that there's a big problem. No one seems to have noticed the problem before, but they find that there's a problem. Then they do a bunch of press releases and speeches articulating the problem. Uh, then they do a massive rulemaking to fix the problem. Lobbyists come in, tell them how wonderful they are. They didn't usually get awards for all the new regs that they passed. Uh, and then they go to enforce the new reg that no one really understands. And next thing you know, there's a bunch of so-called voluntary settlements where people pay to get out of the, out of the uh, crosshairs. Uh, a bunch of press releases then go out uh, saying, look at all the record penalties. Then the agency head quits, puts out a press release saying most successful ever because of the record number of regulations and fines. Um, I told people when they came in, that's not the model for success. Uh, a better model would be someone who's not looking to necessarily monetize it at the end, not put out a bunch of press releases, but instead think about trying to encourage people to comply with the law, try to articulate clear standards, and try to put out rules that people can understand. Uh, and do away with many of the tricks that agencies have built up over the years, which is my third point, sub-regulatory guidance. These are documents and memos and, and folklore that, that have evolved in agencies where agencies do things that are not subject to notice and comment. There's no public input into these, but they, they become a form of law that then they often use to enforce these norms on, on unsuspecting people. The president signed a second set of advisory opinions, or executive orders, not advisory opinions. Um, I'm going to put sites, so that way the Bar Association will give you your CLE credit. Executive Order 13891 and 13892, these directed agencies to essentially not use the sub-regulatory guidance and enforcement. It had to be a previously articulated rule that was publicly known. You cannot keep doing this sort of thing. And it also imposed a, a requirement that agencies try to act in a little more transparent and a little more fair way. Oftentimes agencies end up in, in, in a spot where they think they've told the world what the rules are, but what they've really done is just told themselves. So everyone, everyone within the agency from the ninth floor all the way down knows, but no one in the general public tends to know the rules. Um, that's been changing in large part because of the, some of these executive orders. There was a case several years ago called Sackett versus EPA about the Sacketts who bought some land several plots away from anything that could be construed as a navigable waterway to most people, unless you worked at the EPA, they thought it was a navigable waterway. They came in and shut the sackets down when they tried to develop the land, and then they imposed penalties every day. Uh, tens of thousands of dollars a day for the sackets' failure to comply with the EPA. And then the sackets said, well, we think that's wrong. We want to go to court. And the EPA took the position they weren't allowed to go to court, even though the EPA also thought they could collect penalties from the sackets. And the Sacketts ended up going to court, went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court held that fundamental due process requires you to have an opportunity to be heard. And of course, you can go to an Article III judge to be heard. What's significant about Sackett isn't so much the holding, it's the fact it had to get to the US Supreme Court so that the Sacketts could at least be heard by a judge. Um, baked into these executive orders is sort of a mandate to try to impose the holding of Sackett on the rest of the administrative regulatory apparatus. There's been some success there. There's more work to be done. But oftentimes, agencies would get into the habit of this sort of insular, inward-looking process where they would kind of forget that people needed an opportunity to be heard. I had the honor of serving at the Federal Election Commission. President Bush appointed me in 2008. I served as chairman. One thing I did was impose due process in that agency. There were times where respondents would come in, say they were in an audit. They did not have an opportunity to actually address the commissioners. They would deal with the audit staff. The audit staff would then disappear and go into a, a, a secret meeting with the commissioners, and then they would argue kind of both sides. We're not in France. It's not Kafka's the trial. In America, you should be able to come in and address the decision makers. So when I was at the FEC, I actually did something that was considered innovative. I had oral argument. Lawyers could come in and present on behalf of their clients. And it was amazing how it actually made for better and more informed decisions by the commissioners. Same thing with advisory opinions at the FEC. It was a bizarre situation where you put in an advisory opinion request. If the commission had questions, they couldn't ask you directly. A number of lawyers, including myself, had stories of sitting in the front row while the commission was deliberating a particular advisory opinion request. The commission would be confused on a factual point, but you were not permitted to speak. Commissioners would even say it was very frustrating. Don is in the front row. It's his advisory opinion request, but we can't ask him a question. So the commission then eventually allowed people to come in and present. It was amazing, again, how much of a better decision-making process it was, a much more robust record, and I think made for a better decision. 
The president tried to do this sort of thing with all the agencies with these executive orders and try to open them up so it's no longer necessarily a closed shop. Long way to go, uh, but at least it's a first step. Next, next issue that is, is hot right now is the deference courts give to agency decisions. Oftentimes, thank you, give me a hint. I think I'm, think I'm doing okay. No, I don't think so. You tell me. Am I doing all right? Um, courts at the Supreme Court on down have built up a number of deference doctrines that have happened over the years. Uh, they go back really many, many years, but uh, a series of cases uh, around FDR's time, Chenery 1, Chenery 2 are the cases that sort of began this. The majority did not really give deference in Chenery 1, Chenery 2, and the composition of the court changed. They kind of flipped. If you really want CLE credit, Go read Justice Jackson's opinions in both. That's kind of the touchstone for a whole other seminar that is beyond the scope of what we're doing here today. But from that, there's been a number of doctrines that have built up in a variety of names like Seminole Rock and Auer and Chevron and Skidmore, and it goes on and on and on where it's a whole subculture within the Washington, D.C. community for those who do arguments for before appellate courts and the Supreme Court to be able to rattle all these off. Uh, in very impressive ways. Chevron is sort of the shorthand for all this. Chevron was a case from the 80s. Chevron uh, got into it with the EPA, uh, and they, the fight was over whether uh, one smokestack or five smoke, how, how many emission points there were at a particular plant. Could you count each smokestack as its own, or was it just one plant? And the court said, well, the EPA decided that it was at least it's sort of the less regulatory position, and they upheld it. Seemed fine on its facts, but since then the Chevron doctrine has grown to the point where it's almost automatic deference whenever an administrative agency passes a rule, and if that rule expands or contracts in the enforcement procedure, or if there isn't really fair notice, all that gets washed out to sea under these deference doctrines. Um, ironically, or maybe not ironically, the EPA administrator at the time uh, of Chevron was Neil Gorsuch's mother. She was the head of the EPA. She tussled with the bureaucracy. Uh, it didn't end well. And she went out, she went out not on a high note. Uh, and uh, fast forward, that brings us to judicial selection. Um, if one asks what, what has happened with judicial selection in the past couple of years, you get a variety of answers. But I can tell you what really unifies it is a healthy skepticism of this sort of three branches under one roof administrative state. And the real, the real sort of epitome of this is Neil Gorsuch and his writings. On the Tenth Circuit, he had issued a concurrence in an opinion. He actually wrote the majority, but then concurred off his own opinion, because that's kind of how he is. And he uh, questioned whether Chevron was constitutional. Being a smart jurist, he didn't actually put a period at the end of the statement. He put a question mark. So therefore, he was merely asking the question. Uh, punctuation does matter, particularly in confirmation hearings. But it was a very strong piece questioning the deference doctrines, because his view is that judges ought to say what the law is. They're the ones that are the lawyers who got confirmed. They're the ones with life tenure. They can read legal texts as, as well as the next fellow, and particularly if it's somebody in an administrative agency who isn't necessarily there to be a judge. So um, judicial selection is really, is really focused on almost a subset of the regulatory reform that's going on. And if you look at the track record of a number of the federal judges now on the bench, they have a common tie of folks who have tussled with bureaucracies. They've either done appellate work at a high level, usually against the government. As judges, they've written opinions that tend to be thought leaders on the issue. But it's this it's whole intersection between a private individual and the bureaucratic state ties together much many of the judges that President Trump has put on the bench. Second Supreme Court Justice was Brett Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh is really the penultimate administrative law expert in the country. He was a DC Circuit judge. He has a volume of work uh, with, with how much or how little deference one is supposed to give. He was one that other federal judges always read when it came to administrative law. Uh, other trends going on, uh, and I'll, I'll try to get through this so you can get to your questions, which is the fun part for you, not for me. Um, is uh, how agencies uh, are run, meaning who actually runs them. There's a case going to the Supreme Court regarding the consumer, uh, the CFPB, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, a rather recent agency. Uh, this was part of the, um, after the big crash, this is one of the reforms in the financial industry. It's an interesting agency in that it does not have to go back to Congress and get a budget. It's sort of a self-perpetuating thing. I call it sort of a self-licking ice cream cone. Um, and they get to pick their favorite flavor. It's never the flavor you want. It's the flavor they want. Uh, and uh, they have a, 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 a head 
that cannot be removed by the president. It's uh, Senate confirmed, but once you're there, you're kind of there permanently. Because of the way they do their budget, they pay themselves quite well. Everyone there seems to make about a quarter million dollars a year, which is significantly above what other agencies make. And it's kind of been its own closed system where they have a tremendous amount of regulatory power without much in the way of congressional oversight or judicial oversight. Well, the, the, how, the structure, uh, it, how that structure works is going before the Supreme Court. It's going to be argued the first week of March. Uh, and the question is whether the uh, uh, head of the agency, how they're appointed, is that constitutional? They can appoint it, but they cannot be removed. Is that something that's okay in a single head agency? The, the chattering class in D.C., and you don't have to be the best lawyer in D.C. to speculate on such things. You just need to know how to count to five because that's the majority of the Supreme Court. The chattering class seems to think that that's probably going to be deemed unconstitutional. The, the real uh, rubber hitting the road is going to be whether the whole agency is unconstitutional and how baked into the fabric of the agency the single director without really any oversight is to its functioning. There's a variety of briefs on there. My firm actually filed an amicus brief on behalf of Kevin McCarthy, who's the minority leader in the House, and uh, uh, minority members of the House Financial Services Committee advocating that the whole agency is unconstitutional and going through its history and that sort of thing. If you really want to get extra CLE credit, read the amicus brief. It's on the FEC website. It's on the Supreme Court website. Sorry, I get my, 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 my places confused every so often. Um, other trends are uh, sometimes uh, these penalties uh, that are sort of voluntarily settled. Um, one just got blown up in court. Exxon tussled with uh, uh, the Secretary of Treasury in the OFAC process with about a $2 million penalty. And Exxon went to court and said, the rule that you were imposing is not the rule that when we acted, instead you changed it through informal guidance and, and it was not really a set target. Turns out a district judge bought it and threw out the penalty. This is something kind of revolutionary. This rarely, if ever, happens that you actually can go into court and say that the, the, the agency wants too much of a penalty, uh, and, and they, they were moving the goalpost on the law. So that was an interesting case. We'll see if more of that happens. I think part of it is that people see the new judges being put on the bench. They see the scholarship that's coming from that, the, the concurrences, the dissents, sometimes majority opinions. I think it's having an impact on the district judges. Another case worth mentioning is um, Axon is a company that makes tasers. They are suing the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, they uh, had a little antitrust issue. They tried to buy another company. The Federal Trade Commission said probably violates antitrust, so made them divest the company. Not only did they make them divest, they, were, they tried to require Axon to essentially give their intellectual property, their high-tech stuff, to this company and force them to create a competitor. Now, that's something that really the antitrust never really forced before. This was kind of a, this is kind of a new thing. Perhaps it's a stalking horse for going after big tech. We're not quite sure uh, what they're thinking there. But what's interesting is FTC and DOJ both do antitrust enforcement. If you end up going to the DOJ side, you can always go to court and try your case. Uh, there's been antitrust cases by DOJ where they try to impose settlements and people resist. They go to court and they occasionally win. When you end up in the Federal Trade Commission process, however, you go to an administrative law judge who's picked by the commissioners at the FTC, and then the FTC commissioners ultimately uh, agree with what the staff had originally proposed. Axon, in their briefing, presented 25 years of research. No one has ever beaten the FTC. The commissioners always go back to what the, what the career staff have always recommended in the first instance. So it's not really the sort of thing that seems like due process. It doesn't seem like a reasoned decision. If the government always wins, somebody has to, have a, has to have a case to beat them once, don't you think? Apparently not at the FTC. The other issue in that case, which is kind of interesting, is the coin flip that you get, whether the whether DOJ or the FTC takes on the case. There's a memorandum of understanding between the two, but it's honored in the breach more than, more than its language. And it seems to be a grab bag as to what cases go where. So if you get lucky and go to DOJ, I never thought going to DOJ would be deemed lucky, but that is actually a lucky, thank you, you get the joke. Um, any day you don't hear from the federal government is usually a good day if you're defending people. Uh, but if you go to DOJ, you have a, actually a fair shake than if you end up at the Federal Trade Commission. So there's an equal protection argument there. It's the same statute, but with two different processes, two different procedures, and two different results. So that's one to watch. It's at a district court in Arizona. It'll work its way up through the courts, but that's one that someday can end up being a, a rather large case. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I will now stop the CLE portion, and I think we'll shift the questions because people are looking at me and they're dying to participate.
end and, and Joy will, will pick them up. I'm going to exercise my prerogative to ask the first question, and it's not controversial, I'm sorry. But, uh, uh, but my question is, how do you see the appropriate role of the government lawyer? Like, what do you, how do you see them carrying that out, and how do, how do they reconcile that with their own personal beliefs <coughs> and ideas? Well, it's no different than being a lawyer in general. Uh, you know, you're, you have your duty of loyalty and candor and all that to the client, and you're there to represent the client. You're not really there to put your own views in, in the mix. Um, government lawyers are a little bit different because the question is always, who's the client? Uh, and uh, it tends not to be the same as if you're in private practice, and much easier in some instances, but not really. Those who represent corporations run into this as well. When you have a CEO who wants to do something and you, if you're the counsel for that company and you read the bylaws and you have to tell the CEO, you have to take that to the board. That's not a CEO decision. You need a board vote. CEO is going to be very mad at you for a while. Uh, but that's just life in the big city and that's what lawyers do. It's really no different in the government. Um, it's more high profile. It seems to be you know, more consequential perhaps. Um, but the counsel to the president, job I had, your client is the president in his capacity as president. It's not a personal lawyer who does his wills and estates. It's not, it's not um, something of that sort. It's not all that different from the counsel to the House of Representatives or the counsel to the Senate. Chief Justice has his own counsel, general counsel to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. That person is not sort of you know, doing John Roberts' personal legal work. He advises the Chief Justice in his capacity as Chief Justice as to the institutional progress of the court. Same with the House and Senate counsel. Same with the counsel to the president. So... Long answer to a simple question, but it really baked into your question is who's the client, and in my case, it was the it was the president as president. Now, obviously, different presidents have different points of view. Um, there was a, I remember a meeting one time where somebody said, "Why are you even involved in this? You're just a lawyer." As well, you know, government is actually one of laws, so the lawyers tend to have a, a say in sort of thing. And and certainly, uh, when it comes to how one reads law, there's different points of view on how one does that. So. Uh, you know, I think uh, predecessor White House counsels in the Obama administration probably probably took a strong read of Elena Kagan's opinions at the court, and it should be no surprise that this administration looks at you know, Clarence Thomas and, and Scalia and those sorts of opinions on how to read the Constitution and, and its text. So uh, there is there is judgment calls in there, but you're you're loyal. You still are representing the idea of the presidency, the branch of government. People would sometimes say to me, usually through nasty blogs that I never read, you represent the people all this kind of stuff. And I would say, actually, I don't represent the people. The people, actually, that's the White Dome. You go down there, the House of Representatives, that's where the people go. States are in the Senate, but then they change that in the Constitution. So that's kind of the people, too. I represented Article Two, So when it came to sort of inner branch, uh, in, you know, separation of powers fights, I wasn't there for the people. I was there to represent the powers of the presidency. Uh, and councils to various committees in the House were there to represent the House and, and, and vice versa. So uh, great question. But, you know, who's the client is always a question every lawyer always has to ask before they, before they get in too deep. Uh, thank you, Mr. McGann. My, uh, my name is Michael Domino. I'm a professor here. At, I have been designated with the task of uh, reading the questions submitted from the audience. The first question is what is your opinion on the Attorney General descheduling medical marijuana? I've never touched the stuff myself, so I don't really have a, I don't have any skin in the game. Um, I, don't, I don't really have a personal view. I mean, it's an issue that's kind of hot, and there is a clash between the black letter federal law and what states are doing and racist federalism issues and all that, but it's not really something I focus much on, and like I said, it's not really my thing. Others in the room may have more exciting views on what they think of it, but not my thing. I have a question of my own, if I may. The, in your, your role in advising the president on judicial selection, there's, uh, you have been <laughs> You have been very influential in ensuring that the president chooses nominees who have a proper role of the judiciary and of judicial uh, authority. And I'm wondering to what extent the controversy that has resulted about the selection of judicial nominees is the fault 
of the judiciary. That is, has the judiciary behaved in too political a way and the political branches now uh, in the confirmation process are simply reacting to the, the judges already politicizing the judiciary? Perhaps it probably depends who you ask. Yes, the other branches, they may say yes. Yes, the judicial branch, they're going to say absolutely not. I always kind of view the separation of powers as a feature, not a bug. Branches are supposed to clash into each other. That's kind of the structure that the Constitution envisions. Um, confirmation process in general is, is uh, kind of brutal, to say the least. But I think that um, there is some truth to the idea that the branches are conflating their roles. I feel sometimes that Congress, instead of legislating, which is their power from Article I, wants to spend a lot of time enforcing the law via oversight and that sort of thing. The Take Care Clause, of course, is in Article II. That's the executive branch's power. Um, meanwhile, the executive branch agencies, at least they're sort of in the executive branch, continue to promulgate rules, which seems like legislation. That feels like something that should really happen at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue with the Article I folks. And meanwhile, there's judges who then defer to all this and don't really say what the law is when really Article Three is the one that's supposed to be, at least so they said in Marbury versus Madison, the final word. So I think there is a kernel of truth in what you say. I'm not sure I quite... Would, would phrase it the way you phrased it. But I think there is a frustration where the branches have kind of gotten out of their lane. And I think that comes home to roost in confirmation hearings because I think people want to see all, get, resolve all issues in a single confirmation hearing. And it simply can't be done. There was a time uh, where even Supreme Court justices didn't even get hearings. They went through rather quickly. FDR had a number go through the Senate very, very quickly. Uh, now it is a month, multi-month TV event, and even circuit judges now go through a process that is more brutal than what Supreme Court justices went through 25 years ago. So there's something terribly wrong with, with how we're doing this, but uh, it is a system we have, and uh, you know we can sort of debate causes, but uh, it, you know, it kind of is what it is, so you just have to make, make what you have to do. You just have to get through it the best you can. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I get, I get a little heat from senators when I say this, but, but I would, and it's tough to say lose the TV cameras, but lose the TV cameras. Um, I think cha things change when things are on TV and I think people do act differently. And I think this is why I'm not a fan of, of, of cameras in the courtroom, particularly at the Supreme Court. I think it'll completely ruin the magic that is a Supreme Court argument. I think it'll, I think it'll irreparably change it. Um, what's interesting that people don't see, and I think one way to fix it maybe is to spread this around, is when a nominee for the Supreme Court is nominated, what they do is they go to Capitol Hill and they meet with senators. And they have one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, not really one-on-one. -on -one. Council of the President sits in. They probably have their council sit in a small meeting. And they're quite substantive, quite fascinating. If you're a sitting judge, you're not going to commit to vote some way or not, but you can certainly have a robust discussion on your own record. And if the American public could see the level of preparation some senators put into those, they'd be very pleased. And the amount of detail that goes into it and the thought. And if that could be somehow televised, and I think it would ruin it if it was televised, I think people would actually realize that's really where the action is. By the time it gets to the hearing, a lot of that is already kind of scripted. Everyone kind of knows the questions that are going to happen. Everyone kind of knows the answers. All this has sort of been rehearsed already in the one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, but the more I think people talk to each other directly in these small meetings, I think, I think that's a better way for the Senate to play its role with the advice and consent clause that the Constitution uh, puts in place. But there's no good way to fix it. Um, you know, I guess, I, I guess the, 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 the extra answer would be, if, the, the cynical answer would be if, the, if courts would get out of sort of policy fights, the stakes wouldn't feel so high. But you know, that horse left the barn long ago, and you can go back in history many, many years, many, many decades, even, even previous centuries, where there were barn burner fights that, you know, turned on things where people were saying judges were playing policy and that kind of thing. But there's no one way to fix it. I think it's, it's just, uh, it's a shame people don't see the thought that actually goes in. But once you end up in the TV camera situation, I think that that gives people a warped view.
Next question is, the D.C. Circuit obviously has an outsized influence on administrative law. What effect did the Obama administration's ability to replace three conservative judges with committed liberals have on the administration's ability to cut regulation? To cut regulation. Interesting. Um, the D.C. Circuit, uh, for the first six years of President Obama's administration, um, was very skeptical of executive power through the administrative agencies, and I can't really think of a case the Obama administration won. I can think of a long list of cases where virtually every agency lost one, if not two, major regulatory fights for either going beyond the statute or doing something on a case-by-case -case basis or whatnot. Um, then uh, um, Senate changed kind of how they did judges. You no longer had the filibuster and the minority was sort of boxed out and then there was new judges on the D.C. Circuit and the Obama administration started to win the last couple of years of the administration because they were more deferential to administrative power. As far as taking regulations off the books, um, the, it makes it a little more difficult because there's another case called State Farm where courts will ask if you change a regulatory norm What's your justification? And I'm not going to get into you know a lecture on State Farm, but but you can't just willy nilly change regs. It has to you can still go through the process and that sort of thing, driven primarily by the APA. But when you get in court, you know you're still being held held to task. This administration has not really lost a D.C. Circuit case that I can think of off the top of my head on an administrative fight. There's a couple exceptions here and there. The HHS just recently lost one in the D.C. Circuit, uh, D.C. Circuit, and it was a, it was a case with unified people who otherwise would seem to be ideologically not soulmates. Um, they all agreed that, that HHS went beyond the statutory text. So I, I saw that as a good development in a way because at least there's the D.C. Circuit seriously citing the statute and getting into what the statute means. Um, but long term, the D.C. Circuit has shifted um, and, uh, it's it's not it's not as hostile to the administrative agencies as it once as it once was. Do you think the Federal Election Commission will get a quorum any time in the near future? And do you find the current state of affairs at that agency problematic? Um, who knows? Who knows? The Senate's a fickle place. My guess is they'll probably work something out later this year. It's not the first time there's been a lack of quorum at the Federal Election Commission. There was a lack of quorum in 2008, and so everyone understands there's six commissioners. No more than three can be from the same party, and a quorum is four. So if you don't, if you don't have a quorum um, of the six, then you, if you don't have at least four, you don't have a quorum. And most things you have, you need four or six votes to open an investigation and that sort of thing to ensure that it's not sort of a partisan decision, that it's a bipartisan decision. I don't think it's a problem per se. The FEC is still functioning to a certain extent. People still have to file their reports. They still have to be on time. Uh, eventually, there will be commissioners. So if you just decide to blow off all the law, it will catch up with you. Um, but you, they're still sending out requests for information on the reports. And the FEC, particularly post-Citizens United, has become much more of a disclosure agency, not really an enforcement of, of uh, uh, you know, other sort of campaign finance laws. It's much more uh, of a disclosure place. So that's still functioning. Eventually, there'll be commissioners. It's happened before. It's happened again. It's one of those things when you have the power of the president to nominate and the Senate has to give their advice and consent before there's an appointment. There's occasionally this tension, and you know that's where we are. It's not the only agency where this has happened. The NLRB had this happen in the 2000s. They, they, they didn't have a quorum. They, they tried to continue doing things even though they didn't have a quorum. That ended up going to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, you need a quorum. The statute says you need a quorum to act. You need a quorum. Uh, so it's, this is part of the, the uh, anticipated occasional consequence of when you have multi-headed agencies that require Senate confirmation. What early life experiences and influences have created in you a value system that is uh, so hostile to administrative agencies and regulation? Hostile. <laughs> Me? Don't laugh that much, Ed. Holy and interpret cow. that to be skeptical. <laughs> for those for those watching this at 3 a.m. over the weekend on TV, it's just a number of people I went to law school with are here, and the, they laughed much too loudly when the hostile. Um, 
You know, I, you know, that's, that's a good question. I, I, you know, unlike sort of Justice Gorsuch, my mother was not the head of the EPA and, and that sort of thing. So that I, I don't have some fabulous story. I just, I've always kind of had an aversion to concentrated power. And I just uh, feel that sometimes the government can get a little carried away with itself. And I think it gets in the way of people's ability to enjoy life and pursue their happiness and enjoy their liberty. And it's just one of these things that resonated with me when I was young. I, uh, I watched the Bork hearings when I was in college. My father taped them, and he made me watch them, and I'm glad he made me watch them. And I was at Widener here, I guess it was first year. Clarence Thomas was going through his ordeal, and I watched that uh, wire to wire. And both those events really shaped kind of how I view the government versus the individual. And then I uh, clerked for a judge, uh, a guy named Charles Alexander, on the Common Pleas Court up in the northwestern part of Pennsylvania, and he he shaped my views quite a bit. He's sort of a sort of a mixture of conservative libertarian, turned me on to uh, quite a bit of scholarship and, and writings that I really hadn't uh, read about in college. So that also shaped me. But I you know I, I guess you can you can blame the Bork hearings for me. That's that's kind of where it all goes back. And if you look at a number of the people that President Trump's put on the bench, generationally they all kind of trace themselves back to that point that big bang uh, where something something seemed to really change. So, you know. And interestingly, Kavanaugh, when he was a first year at what I like to call the trade school in New Haven, um, <laughs> he, uh, uh, he, his first year, the Bork hearings were going on. His con law class was watching the Bork hearings. And then a couple years later, I was a first year here uh, at Widener and uh, watched the Thomas hearings. So, there's this sort of this parallel I've detected with people my age where it all kind of goes back to that. I want to call it hostile? Your word, not mine. Not mine either. I'm reading the cards. <laughs> <laughs> no one's owning that hostile word. Uh, there are two questions that are on generally the same topic, so I'll read them together. Could you describe how the process this White House has used to vet and nominate judicial nominees and seek Senate advice and consent differs, if at all, from the process used by the Obama administration? And, and the second question is, how can a lawyer become a federal district court judge? That's it, well. <laughs> and Noah guy, I guess. <laughs> um, district court's a different, a different, little different process. Your home state senators are going to have a big say, so you may want to call Senators Toomey and Casey and get on their radar. Um, I spent quite a bit of time studying how different White Houses did judicial selection, going back sort of Nixon, but really Reagan. Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama. So the question asked the difference between Obama and, and the Trump White House, there's differences among all the administrations. I think um, a couple things were different. One, this administration got a much quicker start. Um, part of it was there was a Supreme Court vacancy. That doesn't happen every day where a president comes in and there's a Supreme Court seat. So that, if nothing else, forced the issue. Um, but there were a number of circuit court and district court vacancies. So the Obama administration seemed to take their time coming out of the gate. They didn't seem to really move quickly, uh, whereas the Trump administration, we moved very fast. Uh, but you still have to consult with the Senate. So what people don't see is what we call uh, pre-nomination consultation. Uh, the Senate demands it. The senators demand it. They see it as part of their advice and consent role. Uh, so I would spend quite a bit of time talking to senators about who they, th they think should be on the bench. If they recommended names, we'd promptly interview them. Uh, we would give prompt feedback. Uh, the, probably the biggest fundamental difference, though, is that in, in this White House, at least in my time, there was no committee. Um, both the Obama White House and the Bush White House had sort of a committee of White House counsel, chief of staff, counselor, head of ledge affairs, all sorts of people were involved in picking judges. In this White House, it was a very simple process. It was really all run out of the White House counsel's office, and it was a pretty direct recommendation to the president as, as to who should be on the bench. Uh, and the president put a tremendous amount of trust in me on, uh, on it, and uh, you know, it, I think pretty good track record of success. Um, but we didn't really have a lot of the internal bureaucracy, which was a, which I think was a difference. We also spent, I think, more time than previous administrations with the senators, uh, being uh, unfortunately a creature of the of the Beltway, uh, and having represented a lot of senators and politicians and that sort of thing. I knew a lot of them personally, so we were able to really engage with them in a meaningful way, where they knew uh, they were actually being treated. 
with the proper amount of respect and with some substance. Um, that's not something that happens every day, and, and most administrations struggle with the Senate because they don't really have folks uh, who really can talk to senators directly uh, about the merits of particular nominees. Sometimes it has to run through the legislative affairs person, that sort of thing. This White House, it was pretty simple. You know, it was, it was I would go see senators. Oftentimes, I'd go see them. They wouldn't come to me. You know, sometimes that's a, that's a whole dance in Washington, D.C., who goes to see who. So that's another way to show respect and show that you're taking their input seriously. Um, but I think that's kind of the, generally the differences. I'd, I'd be curious if I haven't really had this. Uh, I haven't had a panel discussion with any Obama White House counsels on that particular point. But what I've heard is they say a similar thing is that they had much more of a of a of a hierarchy to go through, and it was much more of a cumbersome process. Whereas the Trump administration, it was like most things, kind of cut into the chase. Under Pennsylvania Governor Rendell, each state agency had to review and evaluate all regulations to streamline and rescind archaic regulations. Is there any such process on the federal level? Yes and no. Um, federal level, there are directives out of an office called OIRA, which is the, uh, intergover is the interagency regulatory hub within OMB. All regs are supposed to go through OIRA for vetting, and then they go back out. And there have been you know, different directives to sort of clean up regs. I don't think there's been a top-down systematic, you know, purge the regs. Part of the why that, at the federal level at least, to be tricky to do is because the Administrative Procedures Act, you can't just willy-nilly sort of take things off the books. It has to go through a process. Um, what there are, are these, these executive orders that I mentioned that gets into more how agencies operate, more on the enforcement side, more on the, on the transparency side. Um, I had forgotten that Rendell put that in. That was a good thing to do. Ridge had a system for his environmental where he split up his version, the Pennsylvania version of the EPA, where you actually, if you if you had wanted to sort of comply or turn yourself in, you can go to a different wing of the operation. So the usual enforcement guys weren't going to necessarily crush you. So, you know, Pennsylvania governors have tried to be a little innovative on it. Pennsylvania. I like because you also you have your own appellate court, Commonwealth Court. Here's a lot of these cases. So you actually have subject matter experts to pay attention to this kind of thing. Federal, you kind of you get what you get because it's sort of a unified, much more of a unified judiciary. There's a question that wants you to discuss uh, more of your background. That is, uh, how did you wind up as counsel to the president and uh, partner at Jones Day? I assume they mean after the clerkship that you already described. Um, graduated Widener, clerk for a common pleas judge, moved to Washington, D.C., got lucky and got a, a big law firm job. The firm was called Patton Boggs, which was a uh, kind of a, one of these D.C. power lobby law firm kind of things. I got lucky in that I, I managed to get kind of an informational interview with the person who happened to be the managing partner there, kind of a career advice thing. For some reason, he took a liking to me and then signed me up for a whole bunch of interviews. I remember I was interviewed around Labor Day weekend of 1994, and uh, I asked uh, I asked everybody I interviewed with, uh, and mostly the people who were Democrat, uh, what are you going to do when the Republicans win in the fall? They thought I was nuts. Uh, and I said, no, 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 this is, Rick Santorum's going to win the Senate seat in Pennsylvania. And they, oh, there's no way he's going to beat Harris Wofford. You're crazy. So I, I left. I thought, well, that, that didn't go well. Um, <laughs> election Day 94 happens. The Republicans take over the House and the Senate. Ridge gets elected governor. Santorum's elected to the Senate. Two days later, the phone rings. Patton Boggs, the hiring partner, says, we want to make you an offer. Uh, and I said, why? He said, well, you know, you came into sort of like, you know, the power Democrat firm and said, what are you going to do when the Republicans win before anybody in D.C. saw it? So it's, it's either, you're either going to be a really good lawyer or you're going to be a disaster. It's worth one year's salary to find out. Um, <laughs> So I was there. I did litigation, uh, copyright, antitrust, kind of big firm stuff, took depositions, actually got to court a couple times, having come off a trial court clerkship that gave me a bit, little bit of a heads up, uh, head, head up on people. Um, there was a partner there that did political law, a guy named Ben Ginsburg, who had been the counsel at the RNC for a while, uh, and he needed litigation help. Uh, I had grown up in a political family, had sort of been around campaigns, uh, volunteered for some actual judicial election campaigns in Pennsylvania when I was in law school, so I kind of had the political bug by that point. Did some work for Ben. He apparently was a very tough editor, 
Uh, he made very few edits on the first draft I gave him, so that resulted in a second case, which turned into four cases, which turned into eight cases. Then I became kind of an expert in government ethics and political law and campaign finance. And, you know, when you do campaigns, you have to know phone law and postage stamp law. And so I end up learning all this stuff. Um, and uh, then I got hired to be the general counsel at the National Republican Congressional Committee. So I left the firm and went in-house, did that for a number of years. And then I left there and started my own firm, 2005, uh, and the party became a client. So my first three clients of my own firm were the Speaker of the House, the Majority Leader of the House, and the National Republican Party of, of, of the House Republicans. Signed up a bunch of politicians, House members, and the like. House members are interesting because they go off to be governors and senators. So they ended up, you know, it allowed my practice to grow through really no fault of my own. Uh, and then having developed an expertise, President Bush nominated me for the Federal Election Commission in 2008, confirmed unanimous consent by the Senate. Um, I'm sure they probably regret that one. Same, <laughs> same day as Ray Kethledge, interestingly, who's a circuit judge from Michigan. We both went through basically in the same order. Um, and Ray was on the Supreme Court list that, the, that President Trump put out in the campaign. Um, so I was at the FEC for a number of years. I left. I went back to Patton Boggs as a partner. Turns out that it was kind of in a death spiral, uh, some things that really weren't publicly known at the time. So then the, the group I joined, we were put or kind of went out and talked to other firms and Jones Day liked what we were doing and ended up at Jones Day for a few years. And then uh, yeah, at the point in my career, I never thought in 1994 when I graduated to be at this point in my career, but you get a point where you get a little fussy and picky on clients. You don't take everything that comes in. And I was thinking about what presidential campaign uh, I'd wanted to represent and talked to a couple of different people. One person I talked to was the head of the group called Citizens United. They were a client at the time. And he said, what about Trump? And I said, well, what about Trump? And he said, no, he's really thinking about running. And I said, he, he, said, he says this every four years. You know, isn't he a Democrat from New York? No, he's gotten older. He's conservative. You'd like him. OK, all right. I think you guys would hit it off. So he introduced us, and I went and met Mr. Trump. And then it was a nice meeting. And he signed a book for me. And he actually signed it to my son. And he's put, you're a wonderful, you, you, dear Donald, you have a wonderful father, Donald J. Trump. And I thought, this, guy, this guy's got a pretty good instinct of, of how to handle people. Um, <laughs> Because my, my oldest was, was quite small then. He's still, actually, he's young, but now he's quite tall. Um, and, uh, you know, we, he called me back a couple times. We met some more. I talked to him about policy, life, and that sort of thing. We kind of hit it off. So I took him on as a client, or he hired me, depending on who you believe, and uh, set up his campaign and did all his paperwork and litigation and that sort of thing. And long story short, he wins and then says, hey, you're coming to the White House, White House counsel. And I said, OK, great. And that's how I became White House counsel. So I had a career in Washington, uh, in and out of government. I was also uh, an outside counsel to the House Administration Committee for a while. So I, I've had previous government experience, uh, represented a lot of people in Washington in different situations, investigations, litigation, regulatory matters. So I'm sort of, I became someone in D.C. that kind of understood the levers of power and how government works. So it made sense that I ended up as White House counsel, kind of a, not really, a, not really the traditional White House counsel types. My office, actually, I started about two dozen lawyers, half of them clerked at the U.S. Supreme Court, almost four-fifths of them clerked at an A-list circuit judge, chambers, all fancy stuff, and then there was me. Uh, but I hired a number of other folks who were litigators, partners in smaller firms. So I had a, a blend of lawyers. It was not the usual White House counsel's office where it's only, you know, 12 people from the same law school who clerked for the same justice. I actually had kind of a cross-section of, of people with different skill sets, which, you know, helped me sort of do the job. But that's my basic path is from, from the last time I was here to now how many years later being back today. How has... Uh, Pat Cipollone's style as White House counsel differed from yours? I don't know. I'm not there, so I don't see it day to day. Uh, Pat's a great lawyer. He was a partner at Kirkland and Ellis, uh, which, uh, you know, good firm. Not a great firm. Jones Day's a great firm. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Pat was more of a civil litigator. He hadn't been in government before, quiet. Uh, but, you know, led the, led the impeachment defense in the Senate and got an acquittal. That's something that he's going to have for the rest of his days. He's in the history books for that. Um, my sense is being more of a government ethics, political law lawyer, I probably uh, 
you know, approach the job differently than he approaches it. There's no, there's no right or wrong way to do the White House counsel job. There's no manual. It's not a statutory position. It's not Senate confirmed. You serve at the pleasure of the president. Um, and really, it depends on what the president wants from his counsel and what the counsel wants to put into the job. Um, I had my role models. I looked at Fred Fielding, who was Reagan's counsel for six years, and then he actually went back in for President Bush for a couple of years. Uh, was one of the people I talked to a lot, so I, I kind of had role models. I think Pat did a similar thing and has his role models. But uh, you know, I, I just I, we're two different people, and we're you know we did the job our way, and I think. I think I was the right guy for the first two years. I think Pat's probably the right guy, as demonstrated by his big win before the Senate for the president right now. You had given notice that you would leave your position as White House counsel after the Kavanaugh hearings. Uh, why did you decide to, to leave the position? It's a good question. There's no single answer. When I went in, I was thinking it was probably an 18-month to two-year job. Uh, when I was young in Washington, an old-time crusty political consultant told me once you take these jobs in Washington, your mail's labeled occupant. It doesn't last forever. It's not really your job. People aren't nice to you because you're you. They're nice to you because of your title. So don't get too used to any of these jobs you may take. And I really took that, I really took that to heart. Um, so I went in and with a view that it was going to be for a limited time. And I did what I could while I could. And, uh, you know, got through basically the first two years of the administration. The average shelf life of White House counsel is about 13 months. Um, it's a high burnout job. And if you take out Fielding, who did it for six and then two, and Boyd and Gray, who did it for four under President Bush, 41, the average drops even more to single digits. So um, it you just under two years puts me actually as one of the higher, uh, longer serving White House counsel. So it's one of these things, very intense job. You don't see the sun much. You get there before the sun comes up. You leave after the sun goes down. You always have to be on at a certain point. Uh, you know, you realize it's, it's, it's time to, to move on and go do something else. Are there one or two accomplishments that stand out from your time as White House counsel that you are particularly proud of? No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, right? I mean, I, you know, you get, you get to be right there at the, at, you know, sitting in the row right behind the Supreme Court justices. For someone like me who watched the Bork hearings, watched the Thomas hearings, and then to be part of that someday is something that if you would take a time machine and go back and talk to me in the early 90s when I was here, there would be no way anybody would have guessed that would have happened. Um, um, People may have guessed I would be like in front of a judge, but not necessarily <laughs> not sitting behind them, helping them get, get confirmed. Um, so I think judicial selection is going to be the president's longest uh, and most well-known legacy. It is life tenure, that kind of thing. Uh, so you know, those are probably the positive things. There are little policy fights here and there where, where you know, the legal framework I provided, I think, helped get the right answer and stuff that's kind of boring. But judicial selection is probably number one. Um, and, you know, the work we did on the sort of regulatory reform, I think, is something I'm proud of. That's why I talked about it earlier. Uh, but everything else sort of is a blur. And, you know, you do what you can, then you move on. Can you describe what it's like to offer advice to President Trump and perhaps tell a story or two? I really can't tell stories. I mean, as a lawyer, people in this room can appreciate it. You can't really, like... Unless you're in your own firm, you can't really say, oh, this is what it was like. Um, what I can tell you is, uh, you know, what you see is what you get. He, he, there is no, there is no, like, TV version versus he, he is who he is. He is not someone who comes from corporate America, CEO, board of directors type thinking. He's always been his own guy. He likes to do things his way. And it, you know, it, it works out for him. Uh, he's been very successful, and it's an unorthodox style. In D.C., the big struggle people had, if I had a dollar for every time I heard somebody say this, this isn't how we did it in the Bush administration, or this isn't how the Obama White House did it. And the answer was, well, he didn't run to be that. He kind of ran as a disruptor. He ran on a, on a whole list of things, and he's actually doing exactly what he said, merely because people didn't pay attention to what he said in the rallies. It's not really, you know, that's not really the president's problem. So giving him advice, I found that when it came to legal questions, he was very receptive to it uh, and took seriously the law. I think oftentimes, though, in the executive branch, the law of government, there's not clear legal answers. 
and there's not a clear differentiation between law and policy. Sometimes they overlap. And as a lawyer, at the end of the day, you're not the policy decider. You're sort of advise the client on the legal framework. So there's things that, you know, when you get into that mixed question, I mean, that's, that's where it gets tricky because other voices are in the room, and I think that's the case of representing any politician. I do say, though, he is, he is he, I've represented a lot of elected officials, and the guy can go through decision trees faster than anybody I've represented. It's amazing how he can really cut to the chase. He can see what's coming down the road before most people can, and there's, it, it, it's, it's, it, there's, it's really something. But he's, he's, a diff he's a different kind of cat. He, he has his own way of doing things. It works for him. Uh, but, you know, as a lawyer, we're all lawyers, maybe most of us are lawyers, just like any other client, people have their, have their way of doing things, and you have to, as a lawyer, you know, fit into their, into their mold, right? The client's not there to serve the lawyer, the lawyer's there to serve the client. Okay, the question says, uh, has anything changed in the process of how a proposed regulation takes effect? Anything changed? No, no, it's still, the black letter law is still the same. One thing that changed was the use of um, the uh, CRA, the Congressional Review Act, where Congress can actually essentially veto a reg within a certain number of days of being promulgated. It really hadn't been used before, but for several months of the Trump administration, Congress actually overruled a bunch of regulations that were promulgated at the tail end of the Obama administration. So that's new, I guess. Um, but as far as how the rules are actually promulgated, it's supposed to follow the APA. Some of these executive orders are, are, are intended and by their text eliminate the ability of agencies to use things other than rules to announce law. But the actual rulemaking process, I think, remains as the APA sort of dictates. Thank you very much.